Awesome. All right. Thank you, Dr. Kozar. Thank you, Melissa. Welcome, everyone. Hello. My name is uh, Dr. Roberto Jimenez. I am an, an I'm an, well, I'm an adjunct instructor here at New Jersey State University's Department of Educational Technology, and I believe at this point I'm celebrating my fourth, may possibly soon to be fifth year here at NJCU, and I'm here to talk to you today about ePortfolios Made Easy. Now, I have an agenda for you today, and believe me, this is not going to be death by PowerPoint, folks. What we're going to do today is go through a little bit about understanding what it means when we say ePortfolio. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the tools that are out there, because there are a variety of different tools that you can use to uh, create portfolios, as you'll see today. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about Google Sites, specifically why Google Sites? Why have I chosen this as my platform of choice? for both myself and for my students. We'll do a brief demo at a high level to really showcase how easy it is to create your portfolio in Google Sites. I'll provide some concluding thoughts and then we'll open it for Q&A at the very end of our session today. So with that, let's just jump right in. First and foremost, what is an e-portfolio? When you look at the research, I'm gonna start off with the basic definition provided by Barack and Maskett which talks and defines the ePortfolio as an electronic compilation of, of student teacher work that documents learning experiences and serves as an instrument for recording student evaluation. In short, think of your ePortfolio as this conglomeration of artifacts, documents, could be photos, different media types, Anything that your student, that your learner has created can go into this folder, this digital folder that can take on many different forms and is there to showcase the work that's been created. But more importantly, it's there to showcase the learning that has transpired over a period of time. Another key aspect of defining ePortfolios is the fact that ePortfolios are seen as tools for reflection. When you consider the works of Yancey and Sebrian de la Sedna, who did research on the reflective elements of portfolios and e-portfolios in particular, um, it's not just about creating this big mega artifact and saying, I created a portfolio, here it is, I'm done. But how do you further the learning experience? And one of the ways that you could further the learning experience is by pushing the boundaries and saying, let's take this artifact, let's take this portfolio and share it with your colleagues, with your friends, with everyone so that you can get feedback, which is a prime element in the research of making portfolios a viable tool for metacognition. Now, for those of you that are wondering, for those of you old enough to remember, I know I am, back when I was a kid, I remember that my kindergarten teacher uh, used to have these manila folders and she would put samples of our works, our drawings, our letter writings and poems and other things that we had to put together. And she put it into a manila folder. Sometimes it was a three ring binder. So the idea of collecting student work and showcasing it um, is not a new idea. This is something that's standard in education. But when portfolios went digital, it changed the entire landscape because no longer was it something that a teacher collected in terms of artifacts and information about you, the student, but it became a tool for learning, a tool for assessment, a tool to help you, the learner, really reflect and showcase what you've learned, which ties into the overall benefits about portfolios. Again, you can use them as an assessment tool. And this is not just for K through 12, or even in cases of higher education. As a corporate guy myself, one of the many day jobs I have is I do run corporate learning environments in New York. And I can tell you that portfolios for us are a big thing. We need to see the kind of caliber of work that people are going to bring, whether it's in a job interview or we're considering, considering somebody for a promotion. So I like to think of the portfolio as it's a tool that you can use as an assessment tool. It's a reflection tool. It showcases your work, your knowledge, potential skills, but it's also an empowering tool. 
And I think when we think about the kinds of students that we are supporting or the kind of learners that we're supporting, regardless of whatever your learning environment is, we want to empower our students to become self-directed, to become motivated and self-motivated based not only on the work that they produce, but in showcasing and in communicating that information. Again, all key 21st century skills that we want to instill and develop in all of our learners. The other piece of this is to think about the e-portfolio as a holistic form of learning. In days past, and I might be dating myself here, I remember that art students would put together an art portfolio. My brother was an art student for a while. And he had this big portfolio and he put all of his drawings, he had his pencils, his paintbrushes, and it was all about art. But in this current era, especially when it when you have digital portfolios, the idea here is that you can take all kinds of artifacts, all kinds of media, all kinds of student created content, whatever that may be. It can just simply even be hyperlinks to content they've created online. We can take that and put it into this specific container of information that we call a portfolio to help foster critical, reflective, and multimodal ways of learning. The idea here is that the portfolio is a versatile tool. It can be interdisciplinary. It can be holistic. It can showcase the overall ex learning experiences of a student and not just across a single subject, but across a vast array of subjects. Which is why I look at ePortfolio as being interdisciplinary. Imagine a student being able to reflect on the work that they've been completing in a variety of different classes and bring it together to really showcase what have they learned, what have they experienced, how have they changed over time based on those experiences. So again, creating your portfolio is one piece of it. I'm a strong believer that if you're going to empower students, or you're going to give them the opportunity to really showcase their learning, you need to give them the opportunity to reflect. Reflection is key. Based on the work of Gabaldon, we do know that feedback mechanisms need to be put in place to support student learning. So if I, as a student, reflect on my learning and share that reflection with others, I do need a feedback mechanism. I do need students to be able to come back and share with me their thoughts, whether they agree, whether they disagree, maybe they have a different point of view, maybe they have just a slight variation on what I learned and could actually change the way that I actually approach what I've learned in this overall process. So think of it from a social constructivist or constructivist perspective, depending on your, I would say, background when it comes to learning theories, Regardless of which you subscribe to, at the end of the day, reflection is not just about metacognition, but it's also about the feedback that we receive to help us create these social, these social learning links, if you will, to form new levels and understandings of the knowledge that we've created. So I do believe that portfolios can be tools to celebrate learning. One of the things that we want to do is empower students. We can do that by celebrating the work that they've created in the portfolio. But I do think it's important that sometimes students have a lot of creativity when it comes to creating these portfolios. They can be very imaginative. They can create all kinds of graphics. But as instructors, as guides on the side, if you will, we need to provide students and our learners with a set of what I like to call reflection questions. What exactly are you supposed to think about? What do you want to include in your reflection? Is it about how you felt while you were creating this content or creating some sort of artifact? Is it about your experiences? Is it about how you feel about it after you've received your grade? These kinds of questions are gonna prompt further, deeper thinking and critical thinking that will help our students to articulate what they've learned. But again, in isolation, this may not be as helpful. It's important to get student reflections to be shared across the classroom, regardless of whether you're dealing with K through 12 or you're dealing even in higher education. Student reflection and student collaboration in terms of ideas is key here. I like to think of this from another perspective. I'm gonna use this quote by Dr. Helen Barrett, who is, definitely one of the key researches that came up over and over again in the literature when it came to portfolios. 
And that is that testing gives you a snapshot in time. Portfolios give you a movie. I agree with the statement completely because, again, the portfolio is showing you a collection of different aspects of learning, different ways in which a student has shown their understanding of a topic, whether it's through the creation of artifacts, photos of an event, an actual written document, through the code that's produced, whatever it is that you're showcasing in terms of learnings, the portfolio gives you a greater and much broader perspective of the learning that has transpired. And more importantly, it gives a little bit of broad understanding of the student, the learner in front of you. So that's great and wonderful. Dr. J, what kind of tools can I use? What tools are available? Well, here's an example of my portfolio from a couple of years ago that I'm going to share later tonight. But before I get there, um, let's talk a little bit about the ePortfolio ecosystem. And I want to just highlight the fact this is a non-exhaustive view of the ecosystem. The reality is, based on the definition of ePortfolios, ePortfolios can be any sort of container that contains students' learning, artifacts that can be shared as part of a greater cohesive experience. Because of this, any variety of platforms that can serve as containers can be used. Now, doing the research, when I was looking at all the different, like what are the top resources for ePortfolio creation? I found everything from WordPress sites all the way to Artsonia. Artsonia is actually used specifically for art students as ePortfolios, by the way. You have these live binders, Evernote, and even tools that I didn't even think about that I've used before, such as OneNote or Evernote. Um, but there are other specific tools, such as Edmodo, Seesaw for schools, or even Class Dojo, that provide built-in portfolio tools that can be used by districts. The point is, this is just a sample of what's out there. But if you have the ability to create your own website, whether it's using a Wix platform, WordPress, you name it, you could probably create your own portfolio. That also includes Google Sites, which we'll be talking about shortly. But what's important to do here is check with your district or your institution to determine what existing portfolio tools exist. I have a firm personal belief that if you're going to have students create their own portfolio, I don't want my students spending money. <laughs> I don't care if it's K through 12 or higher ed. Again, let's keep it simple, easy, and more importantly, something that they can create, especially because not all of our students may share the same technical proudness. Some of them may be, you know, very friendly with coding. Some may be a little less so. So look at the tools that exist in your institution and make sure that you understand what tools already exist before you go out there and look at some of the more involved solutions out there. For example, I think WordPress is an excellent tool if you are a coder and you understand how to set up a content management system in the background. If that's not your thing, maybe Google Sites might be a better alternative for you or even Microsoft Sway or Canva. Again, a portfolio can take on a variety of different forms and it can take on a variety of different platforms as you can see here. So check with your institution to see what makes the most sense for you and your student. So I get asked the question by a lot of my colleagues and students, so what should go into the portfolio? Well, that depends on you. This is an image that I showed at the very beginning of this presentation, but I brought it back because it does highlight some of the key artifacts that you could include in there. This can include everything from presentations, it can include publications, documents, it can include media, a YouTube video, a Wii video, it can include even just artifacts to show their learning, such as sample code. If you're doing something with an animaker tool, like creating an animation, you can just put a link to it here. The ePortfolio can contain whatever work you deem necessary or that you would like your students to showcase. More importantly, I think that the ePortfolio should be flexible. What, and maybe have an agreement with your students. What are the things that should be on there? Are there some strong recommendations and suggestions? Are you only looking for a sample of their work? Are you looking for something that's a little bit more 
holistic and complete of what they did throughout the entire semester. These are the kind of conversation points that you need to think about both as an instructional designer and as a teacher, but more importantly, and think about it from the student perspective. What work are they going to have to put into this site and how much work is it going to take for them to actually put this stuff and create the site? That's something you need to keep in mind as you think about what content and is going to go into your portfolio, but more importantly, how much time and effort do you want them spending on the development of the portfolio, which we'll talk about shortly. So some of you might be asking, why Google Sites? As I said before, there is a variety of platforms. A, there is a plethora of platforms out there that you can utilize to create your e-portfolios. And the good news is, look, there's a variety of tools out there that will share very similar attributes. But for my purposes, um, especially for my students, um, I just taught a class literally last semester in the fall. And during that class, we had a portfolio project. And I made a strong recommendation to my students to use Google Sites. Why Google Sites? Because it's easy to use. You do not need any coding. Uh, you do not need to be a user experience or technical design wizard to figure out how it works. If you have those abilities, great. In my case, I gave the students their own, you know, the ability to choose. Choose which platform from the list of platforms that I'm going to give you um, that you can choose from. Choose one that, that works best for you. But for those that I knew definitely needed something a little bit more simpler and something to get straight to the point of what they want to create, aka their container to house all of their artifacts, Google Sites serve my particular need. Um, one pro tip that I learned, especially last semester with my students, is if you're going to use Google Sites, make sure that all of your content, especially anything that you're going to upload into Google Sites, should already be in a Google Drive. That may sound obvious to some folks who are avid Google users, but you would be surprised how many students said, I, I can't find my files. Why can't I upload this file from my documents folder? Well, it's all got to be in your Google Drive first for the most part. The point is, make sure that whatever platform you use, you understand the technical nuances that your, that your students will potentially encounter. This is why I gave a list of suggested platforms to my students. Now, if somebody came back to me and gave me a better suggestion, I said, go ahead, do it. Knock yourself out. What's important here is student choice, but I also want to make it easy and simple because for me, I'm not looking for a beautiful designed website. What I am looking for is, are you able to put the content in here that showcases your learning? And are you able to articulate that as part of your reflection in a way that's going to really show how you've grown both as a student and as a lifelong learner? Now, if you've never used Google Sites before, it's really easy. You log into your Google Drive, you click on the new button, you go into the more section and you click on Google Sites. That's the easy explanation. But what's important here is that when you go into the Google Sites, I'm gonna show you as part of the demo in the next two minutes, um, how you can go in and access the portfolio template. It's just gonna make your life a lot easier. But the good news is you don't have to use that template. You can use any of the templates. There are some caveats to that that I'll talk about, but what's important is this is a great and easy way to help even those students who may be struggling with technology um, to create something fairly quickly. Oh, one thing also, I ran into this a couple semesters ago and last semester as well. Make sure that when your students finish creating their website, they publish it. That's usually the biggest gap that I find. Students don't realize that they never publish the actual site. So I can't view it. If I can't view it, I can't grade it. So just little tips and tricks to be um, thinking about as instructors. But again, I think that when you do a portfolio activity, it's important uh, to make sure that you provide some recommended platforms. Um, because again, sometimes some students just may want some guidance. Some may need more guidance than others. Some you may be surprised will create their own, you know, their own website, and that's great. But 
I still strongly recommend that you provide some recommendations for platforms. You may want to suggest some templates. For my students, I usually recommend they stick to the portfolio template because it is set up in such a way that it'll pretty much deal with the majority of the work they're going to be uploading anyway. Um, I also would recommend that you point out certain layouts, templates that they shouldn't use. Uh, one student, for example, picked a website that just had so many clicks to find things. The overall user experience for me as the instructor just to find stuff was terrible. Never mind for the poor student who then had to demo this in front of their classes. So make sure that you kind of have some parameters of what works and what doesn't before you just say, please choose any platform you want. Um, I also like to provide a very simple example. I don't want to stifle creativity, but sometimes students just need something to react to. And if you give them a sample portfolio they can start from, it'll give them a great opportunity to take what they've thought it could be to the next level. Finally, provide a rubric. And when I say provide a rubric, it's not just about, you know, all the things that need to be on the website, but you need to explain what's going to be graded. Is it the look of the portfolio? Is it how it's designed? Are you looking at its organization? Are you looking at the content? Are you looking at specific pieces of content? Again, where should students focus their time? For students who've never created a website before, this can seem like a very daunting experience. And you want to minimize and quell that nervousness as much as possible, at least where, when it is humanly possible. But I think one of the ways that you can mitigate that is by being very clear and explicit in terms of what are the things that I'm going to grade you on? What are the things that you should focus on, right? If you're trying to create a simple animation that has a boat literally going from left to right, and that's just a nice little add-on and you can't figure out how it works, I don't want you spending your time doing that. I'd rather you spend your time making sure that the content is there, the layout makes sense, everything is organized in a way that the student would be proud to present to their peers, colleagues, parents, et cetera. Just something to consider as you're thinking about planning your portfolio lesson. So now we get to the fun part of this session, and that is the demo. I'm gonna stop sharing here for a moment. Well, I'm gonna stop sharing my presentation. Let's do this. And as promised, let's show you what Google Sites looks like. And I just wanna confirm, if Melissa and, uh, and or Sam can confirm, you do see my current Google Drive screen, correct? Yes. Thank you so much. So folks, this is my Google Drive. We're gonna keep it real simple here, folks. Again, as I mentioned in the presentation, if you wanna create your Google site, go to the Google Drive, the new button, go to more, and then choose the Google Sites option. Now, when you do this, a blank standard generic page will load on your screen. I'm gonna tell you to take the following next step so that you can access the ePortfolio template. Um, even though at the bottom of the screen, you do have, I have this pop-up message that says that I can visit the template gallery, but the easiest way to get there, go to the top left part of the screen and click on the Sites Home icon. That'll now open up the Sites homepage, but more importantly, I can begin to see the template gallery. Now, Portfolio happens to be up there for me because I've been using it a lot, but in case you don't see it, uh, you can click on the template gallery section here and you'll see a variety of different templates that you can choose from. Some are more complex, some are less complex, some are very visual heavy. Again, you can definitely have your students try out some of these and see which ones make sense. I had quite a few students who decided not to use the portfolio template, and that was fine. Again, as long as they met the rubric. But for our purposes tonight, to keep it simple, we're going to choose the portfolio template. One of the reasons I like using the portfolio, or at least I recommend it to my students, is everything you need is pretty much already there. Um, I have an image that I can edit. I can put my name. Um, I have some placeholders already in place 
where I can actually upload, again, a presentation file from Google Drive. I can upload an image. Here's a YouTube link, especially if it's a video that I've uploaded to YouTube. Um, I also have here some other images that I can add. And I, if I need to add more items, I just use these content blocks here on the left. So let me give you a perfect example. I'm going to choose a video. Now, I can either search for a specific YouTube video or I can choose a video that I've uploaded myself. And just for the purposes of time here, because I'm going to show you my finished portfolio so you can see what this looks like. I'm just going to choose one of my previous videos just for the purposes of time. And we'll go here with good old quantitative literacy. There we go. Back from when I used to teach math back in, wow, 2014. Um, what feels like it was an eternity ago. I'm going to show you this fraction review that I did for students. I'm just going to select the video, select it, and it automatically places it for me in this section. I can resize this as I see fit. I can change the location. I can put it in different places. The point is I have a lot of options here, um, which you know, for some people that may be a little too many options, but I think it's a great way to be able to just simply control through dragging and dropping what you want your site to look like. Now, here's the catch folks. I can do this for a variety of different projects. Let's say I wanna upload a presentation. Again, everything that I'm uploading is based on content that's already in my Google Drive. Hence why if you're going to use Google Sites, you need to have your content already uploaded into your Google Drive beforehand. Um, I'm just gonna pick this APA citation um, brief that I had put together for one of my courses at a former college I used to work in. And again, the goal here is I can organize this in a variety of different ways. Um, I can add an image, I can upload an image, I'll select an image in this case. Again, all from my Google Drive, even though I could upload photos and other content. Um, I'm just gonna pick one that we've worked with before from my drive. Oh, I'll just pick one of these just for the purposes of time here. This is some images. Dr. Kozar and I worked on this project a while ago, CFP course. The point I wanna make here, folks, it's easy if everything's already uploaded into your Google Drive. You don't like the way this is organized? No problem. You don't like these fields? Click on them and you can delete them. The beauty of Google Sites is that it has very intuitive controls. Um, I don't have to keep this image, right? I don't even have to, I can even change the color palette. Just click on the different tools and resources and you can start creating a website within mere minutes. No programming skills required. Now, let me show you an example. All right, from my healthier days is what I like to call it. Um, here's an example that I gave my students in my last semester um, from our Pathways course. And in this example, I set it up in a way so that they were able to get an idea of how they should structure their website. These were um, alternate route teachers that were looking to just gain an understanding of how to incorporate technology into their classroom. And I wanted to give them an example that they could use to start with. And here's what we did. Um, I wanted them to include some of their selected work. Again, notice I can include a video. Here's a fraction review that I did um, from my old quantitative literacy class. Here are some examples. We have here some block coding examples, an article, a document that they had to put together. I even included a link uh, to a podcast. So again, Going back to what I said before about ePortfolios, you can take, run the gamut here. You can create one with a lot of media in it. It doesn't have to be. I'm not going to play you the podcast right now. But the point is I can put links to the podcast. I could put links to other resources. I can add different images by using these little controllers. And I can go through the website, add sections about myself. 
I had my students include examples from their discussion boards to showcase some of their, their learning, some of their conversations. Um, and again, in this case, I gave students carte blanche to be able to format this any way they want, whether they were looking to just add pure text directly to the website, whether they wanted to create an embedded document that they wanted to share, or put it into a presentation slide that they can then run. Um, we did something similar with the discussion boards. This is an embedded document where we just simply had them put in a basic Google Doc of their discussions. I also include this reflection section, and this is something that I feel I want to spend two extra seconds on here. Um, if you look at the kinds of reflections, right, it's not just enough for me to provide some questions about reflections. I think students should share the reflections in their portfolio and also present them in a group setting or if you happen to be in a hybrid or online environment they can present it on a zoom or google hangout whatever tool or platform you're using but the point is they should write out their reflection on the portfolio and then prepare their talking points to share their learnings and their reflections as part of a greater discussion with their peers and colleagues. Um, if you look at this set of instructions here, um, I, I, want, I need to give credit to the Aaron Teaches Tech blog. It actually is a pretty good practical website I recommend to many of my teachers in training, but I also use it because it, sometimes it gives me some great ideas. And one of the things that I found here is uh, some work from Professor Graham Although he wrote a book, Learning by Doing, back in 1988, he did write some of the similar work when it comes to reflection and learning. And in this case, he provides a six-step process that can be applied to any activity, lesson, or daily practice, and it can help you as kind of like your guidepost for reflection. Describe the situation. What did you do? What did you experience? What were you feeling? Evaluate your work. Did things go well? Did they not? And why? What's your analysis? What's your attitude towards what you created? Um, do you have any conclusions or changed perspectives that have occurred? And maybe there's an action plan that you're taking because I like to think of the portfolio as an iterative document. It changes and grows over time, just like our students. And if you kind of frame your your thoughts, your reflective questions, and your reflective strategies around these guides from Professor uh, Graham Gibbs, I think it gives students at least a starting point. Now, some instructors might take these same ideas and actually provide very specific targeted questions for their audience, and that's great. Again, you as instructors know your audience better than anyone else, so it's important for you to tailor these questions to the needs and, I would say, wants of your students. Um, but I think that this last quote here from John Dewey, just to me, really hits at home. We do not learn from experience. We learn from reflecting on experience. And that's what the portfolio is all about. So having said that, um, at the end of the day, I can create my website. I can put all my reflections, all my artifacts. Again, how you organize it, I think is less important. As long as I'm able to find it within one to two clicks, I think it's okay. But you wanna leave some room for interpretation, for creativity, right? Listen, I'm, I'm not getting any awards for web design anytime soon, but the port Google Sites portfolio gets the job done. And that's what you, if you're looking for something quick and dirty, this is something that can work for you and for your learners. Now, just want to come back here to one last piece. All right. Some concluding thoughts, because I do want to open up for questions, comments, and any reactions. Um, when you think about portfolios, I like to think of them as, again, powerful tools for learning and reflection. And I feel that you can make e-portfolios very powerful tools for learning and reflection if you provide clear instructions to your students that includes 
clear rubrics on what's being graded and more importantly, how you can support your students' success when it comes to the creation and ultimate iterate, iterate, iterations, if you will, that they're gonna create of their portfolio. Um, it's important to provide reflecting questions. Again, don't just copy. I mean, if you do a Google search on many college websites that talk about the portfolio as a capstone or as a, I would say, main assignment in a course, many of them will include reflective questions that are based on the course content itself. I'd say that's definitely a great approach. But again, you want to tailor the questions to meet the needs of your students and where they are in their learning process. Um, also, providing students the opportunity to reflect on their portfolio is key. I can create an artifact. My portfolio can be an artifact of artifacts, but if I can't provide my reflections about it, you know, are you really getting the most from a learning experience, if you will? And the best way to further that learning experience is to create a feedback loop. Uh, if we'll look at the work from Galveston again, uh, Galveston. Um, we do need to provide a feedback loop. That feedback loop could just be students commenting on the content. It could be commenting on the portfolio, the way it's organized, the way it's structured, the way it's being presented, right? Think of it as social learning that can happen where students are able to talk to each other and really mediate a new level of understanding of their, of their experiences. Now, if you happen to not do this online or you're doing this asynchronously, discussion boards and similar tools, maybe creating a video voice chat, if you will, or, vo or video feedback or audio feedback using voice recording tools can be another alternative as well. The point is feedback should be coming from their peers and colleagues. But sometimes even, you know, may, it's not about getting a barrage of feedback, but I think it helps the learner to really think about what have I learned? What am I getting out of this experience? What have I gotten out of this experience? And are there other perspectives that I can reframe what I've learned based on the feedback from my colleagues and peers? That also includes feedback from the instructor as well. So with that, I think it's important to really take this idea of reflection as a key cornerstone of the O4 portfolio assignment. These are my references, happy to share them after this call, but I do wanna say thank you. Thank you for attending today's session. We are gonna open up for Q&A at this time. Um, what I'd like to do is ask uh, Melissa Wells and or Dr. Kozar if you can help me unmute or at least, oh, I see we have to go to the Q&A. Ah. Yes, so there's question, there's actually um, two questions in the chat box. Excellent. From Joanna. Okay, let's see, just going through them right now. Yep. Excellent question, uh, Joanne. I'm just going to read it out there for everyone. Um, if I ask students to publish a portfolio, would it violate the Educational Privacy Act? Can a portfolio be published internally within the school and not to outsiders? And then I believe it's I mean for a fifth grader. Um, Joanne, excellent question. Short answer is this. The platform that you use for your portfolio is going to play a significant role. One of the challenges with Google site is that when you publish it, you're publishing it out there into the web, right? So now it's available out there. So in that case, Google sites may not be the best choice. Um, one thing that you could do is look at certain internal platforms or find out from your own tech teams if you have any IP restrictions that are in place so that, lim that may limit um, who can access the website but I would probably strongly recommend looking at other internal resources and tools to create their portfolio. For example, some students are using Canva or they use Microsoft Sway as an example of creating a portfolio. And what they do is based on their single sign-on and other 
technical structures they have in place, what they do is they prohibit anyone without certain credentials of the school district to be able to access those files. So I would say you may want to consider looking at what internal platforms that are protected internally um, could be used in that case. The other alternative is you do have a student who can then share with you um, maybe even if, if, if you have a platform like a class dojo or if your LMS has a portfolio type environment that you could use, you could use those tools internally so they only share it with you if that if privacy issues are a concern. So the platform of choice in this case may not be Google Sites. But it's an excellent question, Joanna. Thank you for asking it. Joanna, did you have anything else you wanted to say because you're unmuted? No, I don't, thanks. That was a great response. Very helpful. No, and Joanna, I can tell you, I first of all, that's an excellent question. And second of all, um, this is exactly the kind of thinking that we, all of our teachers, myself included, need to think about. Because at the end of the day, we have many great tools that are out there, but which ones uh, could be problematic privacy-wise when it comes to sharing student information? Definitely see what's out there. In one of the schools I used to work in, um, which was ASA College, um, everything was restricted used because they had an Office 365 account. So everyone was restricted that you had to be um, an actual ASA College student in order to even access those accounts. So there were some limiting structures, but again, definitely see what makes sense. Google Sites, the likelihood of it being pushed out there into the public could be a very big concern. So excellent question, Joanna. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, will it be affected if you're five minutes ill? Please be patient. Um, are there any other questions? I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. I don't know if Dr. Koch, Dr. Future Dr. Wells, <laughs> um, or I have, even I have, Dr. Kozar. <laughs> I have a, uh, Laniz actually has a, a question that was in the Q&A. Um, and Laniz, you're actually unmuted. She asks, have you seen AR presentations as another digital portfolio option, which is more interactive? That's a great question. That question. is, first of all, that's like advanced stuff. I didn't want to even include it in this presentation. I thought that might be way too advanced. Um, AR is being looked at as another possibility. Augmented realities. Um, there are some people that are even looking at virtual reality environments uh, or metaverse related type environments to create uh, portfolios. Remember, all the portfolio is by definition is a container, right? As long as you have a place, a digital place where you can put these artifacts in, you have a portfolio. So if you're able to create a virtual space uh, where you can store content, have people visit it, you have yourself a portfolio. And getting into the mixed realities, virtual realities, augmented realities, all of them play a potential role in future portfolio usage and development. Excellent question, Lenise. Thank you. I was just thinking like just to have it where instead of it just being a teacher and student, you know, collaboration to have other students be involved and in seeing the portfolios of their, you know, classmates. So mm -hmm. just to have something available in the classroom, like, you know, a virtual gallery. Excellent idea. And actually, um, I would encourage it. I have one colleague, especially when, when I was doing some of the research and I was picking the brain of one of my colleagues, she talked about how she actually has um, students who are work, they're currently working on some sort of international project where they interact with students in another country. And they mm -hmm. actually were sharing their portfolios with each other because um, they were also all working on a similar project. So um, again, the possibilities here are, endless in terms of creating that social feedback loop, if you will, to create further learning and knowledge construction. So great ideas Very there. Thank excellent, you. excellent questions by all. Joanne, I'm not sure if you had, a, I see your hand up. I don't know if you have a question or even another question. No, I don't. Thanks. I was going to say, happy to answer it if you have one. <laughs> Dr. Wells, or as future Dr. Wells and Dr. Kozar, Dr. Koch, any further questions or anyone else on the call? 
You know, I, I wanted to piggyback off what was what you were talking about, the augmented reality. Um, is there any programs or apps or websites that from the top of your head that um, you could maybe show us if if we did want to start augmented reality student portfolios or like where would we start if we were a teacher in the classroom and somebody asked us that? Great question. I mean, I can't think of one off the top of my head right now, um, but I can tell you that there are people I'm, I'm going to date. I'm going to date myself really badly right now. So for anybody that knows this, um, you know, there was even talk in some of the older research of using um, old social media platforms. But they were also talking about, oh, God, what is the name of it? I just had a, a complete blank. There were virtual communities. And I can't think of the name right now. It's eluding me, which I'm really embarrassed that's eluding me right now. But I remember some of these old virtual I was, it's not my space. It'll come to me, of course, after this call ends. But the reality is, if you are able to go into certain environments, um, whether they're virtual, doesn't matter. Like you just go on there and you create your space. That space can become a portfolio. Like it's not, that's the beauty of these portfolios. It's not limited to any single specific platform. Um, in the research, it's very clear. Any place that you can store content and share it is a portfolio. Um, one set of students were using tools like PowerPoint. And at first I said, PowerPoint? How is PowerPoint a portfolio? What the student did was they actually placed links to different artifacts as part of a slideshow. A little low tech, not exactly what you were thinking of, but it is a portfolio in a sense, right? Same thing with virtual environments. I mean, uh, I'd like to probably create a nice little 360 environment where you can just touch all the different artifacts and be able to open them and view them. I think that, th again, possibilities here are limitless, but I think it's also about, from a practical, more pragmatic approach, what really makes sense for your students. Now, if you have students that want to test the waters of AR and XR, I'd say, or do it, try it. But I'm a very pragmatic, practical corporate kind of guy. So I like to stick to simple, easy, you know, the, lead, the path of least resistance for my students. But Melissa, I'd say Google any Google environment. I can't say that right. Google any virtual or mixed reality environment. And you got yourself the beginning of a portfolio. Thank Which you. would be more help, but I can't even think of one right now. Thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Great question. Any further questions? Um, I would also recommend if you have a chance, definitely take a look at the work from Yancey. Yancey definitely has come up quite a bit in my research. She came up um, definitely as a very quoted resource. I'm just going to go back to my reference slide here. Um, Yancey's latest book is uh, ePortfolio's Curriculum. Um, definitely has a global perspective, so you could see how ePortfolios are being used around the world. But I think it's important to really look at the work of Gavaldon um, as well. Um, again, we're, we're only touching the surface here, but there's a lot of research out there on portfolio as learning tools. And I strongly encourage anyone who hasn't even tested portfolios as an assignment in their class, them to consider it when you think about the next time you're, you're designing a reflection piece or a possible capstone type assignment. So with that, I'd just like to thank you all for attending tonight and thank you all for joining us. If you have any questions, um, I can be reached at rjimenez2 at njcu.com. I'm just gonna put that in the chat. Anybody wishes to discuss the topic further. But again, thank you for your time today and enjoy the rest of your evening.